Joining me now, Wells Fargo Investment Institute President Daryl Kronk. Daryl, what is your take on the climate of fixed income and stock markets and how they match up at this well, point? Well, it's a good question, Dagan. This, this recent correction actually had both correlated where yields were rising as stocks were falling, which is somewhat atypical. We've broke that a little bit. I think the bond market the last has... Last couple of days, yeah, right? You had money is, go, you know, volatility pushed money into right. bonds, which is kind of what you'd want to see. Monday afternoon, right. uh, late in the session. Um, I actually think the bond market has handled this correction very well. You haven't seen a spillover into what we'd see as traditional safe havens. So commodities, the U.S. dollar, um, yields, there's no gap out in high yield spreads. Mm -hmm. So the lower tier sections of the credit market have behaved very well, actually. So this is a lot like... Um, the equity market's catching a bad bout of this flu mm -hmm. that's going around, but the flu hasn't been contagious to the other asset classes yet. So how do you see tax reform playing into interest, interest rates and inflation? I mean, the way that the tax reform is structured, it seems to be supply side. Um, mm -hmm. So in that, in that way, companies are investing in CapEx, which will help increase productivity. So you won't, shouldn't see that much inflation. Is that, do you agree with that assessment? How do you see that playing out? I absolutely agree yields? with that, Lindsay. I think um, inflation will trend mildly higher and some wage inflation is a good thing. Wage inflation with productivity growth, to your uh, point, is actually a good thing. Wage inflation without productivity growth, where it just increases unit labor costs and squeezes profit margins for companies, is a bad thing. We don't expect a lot of inflation to tick higher, but mild inflation higher is actually a very healthy thing. So, Dal, at what point do you think rates have to back up to to see a shift from equities back to fixed income? I think three and a half, four. Yeah, I, I think three percent is a psychological level right now for the market as it tries the equity markets as they try and find their base. Um, north of three and a quarter to three and a half, I think starts to squeeze profit margins at that point. Um, but where do you see for your clients? Where do you see money actually shifting out of um, uh, out of uh, stocks into bonds? At, uh, at that type of level? Yeah, I think it, at three and a quarter to three and a half, really? you, you start to get the equity risk premium mm -hmm. um, to be more equal. Today, it still favors equities over fixed so income. So, right where is Wells projecting kind of 10 year rates year end 2018? Uh, 275. We've got a range of 250 to 3, 275 with a midpoint. How, how is that possible with? the economy growing as strongly as it is, at least in the, because of the tax reform, and it, it, certainly in the first quarter, but really the rest of the year, that's what's expected. Yeah, I, I do think you'll see stronger growth. We think 2.9, uh, 3% GDP growth. Um, but when you look at the amount of supply issuance that has to come on the market for treasuries, um, this has been the, the false narrative that, that everybody's had forever, which is kind of that higher growth has to equal higher rates almost immediately, and it may equal them in the intermediate term, but in 2018, we don't see a big spike up in rates. So you stay invested in equities then for the yes. remainder of the year, and what sectors do you like? Um, right now, we actually like financials, we like industrials, we like consumer discretionary, um, and we actually like health care. So, th so three of those four being more pro-cyclical for better growth, better economic uh, environment. And and, and financials, just to name one, a benefit of deregulation coming out of Washington. Absolutely. That's right, Diggin. I, I want to talk about what we've seen with the, the kind of bets that were placed on stable markets, the bet against volatility over the last couple of years, and the losses that were abruptly and surprisingly exposed just in the last couple of days. These two, one in particular, this XIV, it is a well-known product yeah. uh, sold by Credit Suisse or constructed by Credit Suisse that sent, shut down yesterday after it lost almost all of its money uh, in, in trading. It was really late Monday. But again, when you've had such loose monetary policy, yes. money flooding the market anywhere and everywhere, you're just beginning to see the overconfidence and the really... The, the kinds of bets that not just individuals took, but institutional investors. And do you expect, because again, and I keep repeating this line, you find out who, who's naked only when the tide goes out. Yeah. And do you worry that that kind of volatility and this kind of law, these losses could impact the stock markets and hold back the bull market as it comes up on its nine-year anniversary? Um, two points there. From the institutional side, you're, you're exactly right. So that's 
part of what we saw in Monday's action. So you have this, it's a little complex, but you have this risk parity and macro CTA funds that when volatility is really low, um, their models suggest that they overweight risk assets. Mm -hmm. um, and as soon as volatility spikes, those, those algorithms or that mass suggest they have to sell those risk assets, which is why you saw a flood into treasuries right. Monday afternoon and rates come back down. To your second point, the individual, when you see this kind of volatility, it can damage psyche. Right, so the individuals, you know, this, this year's been a narrative of, of two months, right? January was all about pro-tax reforms, better growth. We walked in with the best earnings expectations for the whole year. Now February has been all about, well, wait a minute, what if the Fed goes too far? What if inflation becomes problematic, right? And those two narratives have to balance each other out over time. And I think the market, even today, is still trying to figure out which one is going to play. But you're, you buy stocks here, is what you're saying. We you buy, buy more of the January narrative at this point than, than the Feb February what narrative. What would change your mind? Um, what is, is there any kind of marker that you're looking for? Uh, inflation. Inflation is the primary marker. So if you would see a spike materially higher in inflation data, not just wage inflation, but core inflation as a whole. And remember, the PCE that the Fed uses mm -hmm. is still at one and a half to one point six percent. Yeah, but I said I said this yesterday. Maybe all of that <laughs> that cheap money. From, from central banks, once it winds up in the hands of individuals who don't just buy risky assets with it, they actually start going out and spending it. That's when you need to start Absolutely. worrying. Yeah, that, that's true. That's that when, when mom and dad and brother and sister uh, out there in the country. But you don't see that in the consumption patterns quite yet, right? Yet. I mean, yet. yet. Quick the, question. Yes, yeah. now volatility continues throughout mm -hmm. 18. Yes. Well, a, no, no, certainly yes, on a no. relative basis from 17, I've been right? told we're wrapping twice, so. Okay. Yes, no. <laughs> <laughs> he said yes, but. Yes, absolutely. Well, and you can't bet on stable markets, at least in some of these exchange-traded products anymore. And volatility is a healthy thing, so I think we should welcome a more normalized level of volatility, not the extreme low volatility we had in 2016 it's and 17. Sh it's shaken some people out of this market, though. Daryl, thank you so much. Thank Daryl Cronk.